coming to the tubercular endometriosis, this is a normal endometrium which looks triple line endometrium. You always try to keep an image of the normal endometrium and you keep on comparing when you see an image. When you see, you do a routine sonography. The signs of acute endometritis are very rare. The normal endometrium pattern, but what you can see, the normal endometrium will build on. If the endometrium could be jagged, thick or calcified plate. If it is a calcified, you can see a caustic shadowing. There is a mild enlargement or decrease in the size of the uterus depending upon how much atrophy has been occurred. The normal triple line endometrial pattern is lost. Depends on that the endometrial thickness also depends upon how much your basal endometrium is reactive. So this is a normal flow in the endometrium which you see. Here you see the normal endometrial pattern is lost. The endometrium at places it is echogenic, at places it is cystic. And this is how you can say that if this could be of endometritis, could be any other infection, could be tubercular. Now to say it is a tubercular endometritis, you have to do endometrial aspirate cytology or the culture of microbacterial tuberculosis which only in 30 to 40 percent cases is going to be positive. Sometimes history, sometimes other things helps you to say it is a tubercular endometritis, nothing else. There is another picture in which you see that this endometrium is totally calcified and these are the women who are coming most of the time with, to you with this case of secondary amenorrhea or a very scanty period in which the endometrium is not at all reacted. There is another picture in which you see the endometrium is absolutely calcified, there is acoustic shadowing is there. To say whether this endometrium is reactive or not, sometimes you have to correlate. So all the time, sonologists cannot do everything for you. You have to correlate that you have your patient has been examined on this day of the menstrual cycle and the sonologist has given a report of only 6 millimeters on the day 21. That means that something may be wrong. So then you start thinking maybe she is having an implantation defect, maybe her endometrium is a problem, maybe she is having only the endometrium, uh, tubercular endometritis and because of this it is this. Because many times recurrent abortions are also because of the endometritis. Intrauterine sinica is another presentation of the tubercular endometritis that is known as Asherman syndrome. A very long ago it has been diagnosed and it has been said it is very rare but now we see quite often we cannot, we, we pick up the cases on so, by sonography but we do our treatment management by the hysteroscopy. So that's seen during the late proliferative phase of the, my, uh, of the menstrual cycle because here it is, a condition is there so you can see you can pick that sinica calcified uh, spread uh, better than in any other phase of the menstrual cycle. Normal uh, endometrial pattern will be lost. The endometrial thickness does not correspond to the day of the menstruation. It is ecogenic, eccentric, focal areas can be seen in hypoechoic halo of the endometrium. During UK phase, this ecogenic pattern of the endometrium is lost because endometrium already becomes quite ecogenic. So here is a picture in which you can see this is endometrium. There is a small amount of the fluid is present and there is a calcified specs are present. When you do it, this can be diagnosed better by if you are doing a hydrohistrosonography because you just inject the saline into the endometrial cavity. It descends and then these sinuses can be picked up very well. As I have already said, so this is another picture in which we have dilated the uh, endometrium and you can see very well you can pick it up the pictures. So, cervix, it's a very rare, we have seen only two or three cases of the tubercular cervix. This is a woman who has come to us, only she was age of 20, she came to us with recurrent vaginal bleeding. And when we have seen, we found that this is a cervix, you can see the cervical diameter, the enteroposterior diameter is much more than this. It, you cannot diagnose as I said, but we have seen in the 20 years why the cervix is so large. This is not the age. Then by she, on even when we have done a clinical examination, we could not find it out. Then we started, it has given us the lead to investigate her and to only confirm that she is a case of tubercular cervicitis because it is a triple disease and then we could treat her. So to sum up we can say that EVS is a good non-invasive cost effective method to study the course of disease extent when beyond pelvis especially in those cases where pelvic examination fails to reveal any abnormality like chronic endometritis, amenorrhea, hypomenorrhea, intrauterine sinusia due to this uh, genital tuberculosis. Detailed anatomical and vascular study of the endometrium, myometrium, tubes, ovary and adnexa is possible and thus it helps to make the diagnosis, it helps in the management, 
also because if we see any woman who is coming with a secondary amenorrhea and if we see that it is less than 3 mm, we know if we are going to give a progesterone challenge test, it is not going to respond to right to waste another two weeks. Instead, give her both estrogen progesterone and see whether your endometrium is reactive or not. It saves time, revisit and money, revaluation of endometrial response after hysteroscopic adhesolysis appearance has triple risk. Because if you have diagnosed this and uh, Asherman syndrome is there, you have done adhesolysis, the response could be visualized only by doing a transcendental sonography. So it revaluation the medical therapy, helps in deciding the surgical intervention, prognostic value, especially in cases of ART procedure and whenever there is an implantation defect, when you are doing your follicular monitoring, you see your endometrium, whether it is corresponds or not, if it doesn't, you know there is defect is here. So the clinical history, pelvic examination, various other investigations, even culture the microbacterium from the body fluid has got lower sensitivity, nearly about 20 to 50 percent. The direct visualization of the pelvic organs and the involvement gives indirect evidence and helps the clinician to investigate further and that is how the ultrasound helps in making the diagnosis. So I just want to show you, this is my alma mater which has taught me and made me to stand here. I really respect and worship all my teachers who have given me this knowledge to share with me. And I really want to thank Dr. Gadani because he is shouldering a lot of responsibility of teaching. There is a greatest responsibility the teacher has got because the students are going to say to everywhere that this has been taught to me. So Dr. Gilani has really taken a very a lot of responsibility on his shoulder and I hope that this institute is going to grow like anything in whole Asian countries, uh, Asian countries and I wish all the best to this Asian institute of Dr. Gilani. Thank you so much. Thank you Professor Dr. Yashodra. Our next talk is by Dr. Dure Sabi. He is the director of Minar Nishtar Hospital Multan and has presented many papers on different national and international forums. He has also introduced a medical imaging forum at Yahoo at medical imaging at yahoogroups.com. He has contributed a lot in upgrading the standards of ultrasound education in Pakistan and in this regard he has also written a book on ultrasound. I invite Dr. Dure Sabi to present his lecture on concretions. We are imaging things query. Thank you, Nasir. I hope there is something for everyone here. For those of you who don't know about concretion, um, you are going to be informed and educated. Those of you who know about concretion are going to be amused. And those of you who use concretion are going to be very angry at me. So, please bear with me. What is concretion? Basically, this is um, slightly criminal creativity. You create a finding to satisfy the symptom. There is a lot of concretions going around and my friend from Keen, he is a member of the MI, calls this concreation. So you are creating something. Specifically what it refers to is that the patient comes to you, the scenario is that the patient comes to you with lumbar pain and you can't make anything out so you say you have concretions. Okay. And that is what I am going to debunk in this talk. Okay, probably what uh, they are saying is that there are very small stones, these are almost subvisible or perhaps even invisible. So if something is invisible, you shouldn't be seeing it. And if you can't see it, you shouldn't be reporting it. Uh, and what happens is that although the patient goes away from your clinic relatively satisfied so that you pinpointed his problems but the patient might be denied appropriate therapy and might be 
treated on the long lines uh, on the wrong lines for several weeks or even months and and really end up worse than he was before he came to you now lumbar pain is a very very common problem now uh, in one study the in the sample done in united states about 85% of adult americans had had flank pain but this was of musculoskeletal origin you have a huge differential diagnosis in 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 the causes of lumbar pain you have a, a huge number of pathologies and situations and conditions which can cause lumbar pain and renal stones is only one of them now this is a slightly unfair slide because it implies that all of these causes contribute equally to the statistics of lumbar pain they don't and renal stones are probably one of the uh, major causes of lumbar pain but not every patient who comes to you with 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 lumbar pain and in whom you can't see stones has concretion okay a lot of them might but a lot of them don't okay another study 800 patients with suggestive history of lumbar pain okay on history and clinical examination you say yes probably this patient has lumbar pain or flank pain of renal origin and of these properly worked up, worked up patients only 67% had renal stone origin pain and of these the population that really had renal stones only 66% were picked up on ultrasound so ultrasound is not a very hot thing to either diagnose or exclude small stones in the kidney okay so the dilemma is that the patient is, is with you with with flank pain and the question that you need to answer that you that you are supposed to answer is this renal calculus disease or is this not renal calculus disease now if this isn't renal calculus disease or if you say that i can't see anything the patient will invariably retort and say to me mujhe dard kyun ho rahi hai why do i have this pain if you can't make out the cause why have i come to you and you lose face in front of the patient you also appear incompetent to the referring physician because he has probably already decided that this is a patient of renal stones and he is being sent to this particular uh, sonologist and he is going to pick out these stones and i'm going to op- to to treat him on the lines of these stones and you disappoint the referring physician when you tell him that no i can't see anything this probably there aren't any stones okay so you have a lot of pressure this is, this is a lot of philosophy going on you have a lot of pressure to find something wrong to explain the symptoms to the patient and that leads to conclusions okay so so the solution to this dilemma is well, what leads to conclusion that every tiny echogenicity is a potential stone but the kidney is so full of tiny echogenicity that you need to really know what echogenicities are significant and what echogenicities are part of the normal anatomy and the artifacts that you come across so very frequently and now for the medical part and i'm going to tell you what the normal echogenic structures in the kidneys are due okay any tiny echogenicity might be a stone because you see a big stone has to start as a small stone and there has to be a time when it is 3 mm or 4 mm or 2 mm and perhaps uh, occasionally you are picking out those tiny echogenicities and they do represent very small stones but there are also so many areas of bright echogenicities in the kidney that can mimic stones and in fact a paper on this has been accepted for publication by the uh, journal of ultrasound and medicine and should be out in the december uh, issue now the known reflectors can be broadly divided into vascular and non vascular structures okay now one of the ways of of looking at the kidney is that uh, the kidney can be thought of as an arteriovenous shunt okay you have you have two organs with a volume of about 300 ml that is taking about 20% of the cardiac output which which calculates to about one of or over 1 1 liter per minute so you have three or four times the volume of blood rushing through a particular organ so so you can imagine how vascular and how full of vessels this particular organ would be so you, basically it is a clump of vessels with an occasional uh, nephron thrown in between